welcome you all to the uh, summer lectures, uh, the first of the summer lectures for 2009. We've been doing this. The communications department has been uh, sponsoring these since the uh, early 90s. So uh, this is quite a tradition for us. Uh, my name is Paul Price, by the way. I'm with the communications department. And I'm uh, here to introduce our first speaker. Uh, what we've been trying to do with the lectures is to learn about the lab's most exciting research uh, from the people who are actually doing it, and in terms that all of us uh, non-specialists like me can understand. And nobody fits the specs better than today's speaker. Bob Shainline uh, is at the forefront of one of the most exciting uh, revolutions in what's come to be called photon science. Uh, photon science uh, uses accelerators to produce bright beams of coherent light to examine everything from materials to biology to the history of the solar system in the case of the advanced light source. Bob got his bachelor's, master's, and PhD degrees all um, in one place, MIT. Uh, he uh, got them all in electrical engineering. He came uh, to Berkeley Lab as a postdoc, and for the past 15 years, he's been with the Advanced Light Source and with the Chemical Sciences and the Material Sciences Division, uh, winning numerous awards for his uh, work with lasers and x-rays in the process, and he was recently named the uh, ALS's Deputy Director for Science. Uh, his own scientific pursuits have taken uh, two distinct paths. On the one hand is the science itself. He's made major advances in understanding how electrons behave in concert with other physical properties, such as light temperature changes, applied electrical and magnetic fields, uh, vibrational waves known as photons. Um, all of these things working together to, to determine the specific characteristics of materials and chemical reactions and biological processes. The other distinguishing characteristic of Bob's career has been his work with the groups from the ALS and other divisions, including the uh, engineering division, the accelerator and fusion research division, to build the tools that he and other users need to do this uh, ultra-fast science. First, he developed uh, laser-based ba techniques for manipulating um, electron beams to generate ultra-fast X-rays. Later, he used the ALS's LINAC injector to generate femtosecond hard X-ray pulses, and more recently, uh, built a prototype femtosecond beam line for soft X-rays, uh, which was followed by a whole family of ultra-fast slicing beam lines at the ALS. Uh, in this regard, Bob is helping lead the way to the light sources of the future, and he'll, uh, they will carry on the ultra-fast science he's uh, here to tell us about today. So here's Bob. Well, thank you very much for that uh, very generous uh, introduction. Um, I know there are uh, some specialists I see in the audience, at least a few of you, but I assume for most of the audience, the, the whole idea of ultra-fast science is maybe sort of a new concept or even a foreign concept. <laughs> Um, so I hope during the course of this talk, I'll give you some perspective on ultra-fast science. Um, it's a very broad field. I won't it, attempt to cover it in its entirety, but I'll try to sort of hit some highlights that particularly relate to work here at the Berkeley Lab, um, focusing on the application of ultra-fast lasers and ultra-fast x-rays um, to look at the motion of atoms and electrons. Um, uh, and from these sort, of, um, these sort of studies, looking on these fundamental kind of time scales, we can get sort of new um, insight into the physics that underlie um, materials uh, and chemical processes that, that um, are very important, actually, for um, a variety of human activities. Um, so let me sort of start with a kind of very general description. Um, this shows um, time scales um, and our ability to measure fast time scales um, over several decades, um, over several centuries, going back to sort of 1600s. Um, so prior to that time, we could sort of discern events more or less on a time scale of a second or so, um, mostly dictated by the response time of your eye. Um, and there were some gradual improvements um, using the light from the flickering candle, using uh, chemical flashes, using crude electronic techniques. People were able to push this sort of time resolution down to sort of millisecond time scales um, um, by about the 1800s. Um, and there, uh, electronic techniques and, and more um, uh, following that stroboscopic techniques um, pushed the resolution down to the nanosecond time scale. And here, around the 1960s, with the invention of the laser, you see this precipitous drop um, where now we can uh, make measurements um, not only the femtosecond time scale, but even now um, in the attosecond time scale. Um, so it's sort of 10 to the minus 16 to 10 to the minus 18 seconds. Um, so these are sort of the various acronyms, uh, and I'll try to give you a little bit of perspective on these um, as we go along. But let me start with 
um, an example for sort of, from sort of this sort of time period um, around the 1850s or so um, that sort of illustrate our ability to measure fast events. Um, and this is sort of a, a classic example that people use when they're introducing this field because there's sort of a, a funny story um, behind this. Um, this is a, a story about Leland Stanford, um, who was a go governor of California and founded the esteemed university across the bay. Um, and as you know, he had a, a farm down on the peninsula uh, where, the farm, where the Stanford farm is now. Uh, and he r raised uh, thoroughbred racehorses. Um, and at some point he had a uh, bet with one of his cronies um, about the dynamics of how a horse runs. And in particular, whether at any point during the horse's stride, all of his feet are off the ground, or whether in fact a horse always has one foot on the ground uh, at all times. So this is the bet. Um, and what Stanford did is he um, hired, a, um, commissioned a, a famous photographer at the time, uh, Edward Mybridge, who was famous for um, uh, still life photos and photographic techniques, um, to come down to the farm and actually take photos of a running horse. Um, so this is around um, 1878. Um, and these are the frames that, that Mybridge took uh, of this horse. Um, and if you see this in animation, you can actually see um, the answer uh, to this bet th that Stanford had. In particular, you can see very particular times when, in fact, all four of the horse's hooves are off the ground. Um, and so Stanford won his bet. Uh, and this sort of gives you an idea of what people are capable of at this sort of um, period. Um, more than 130 years ago um, with resolution on the order of uh, um, a few tens of milliseconds. Let me go to another example, flash forward to maybe 40 years ago, or actually the early work on this started um, sort of in the 1930s uh, and in the 40s. Um, and this is the field of um, high-speed stroboscopic photography. Um, and really the inventor of this field was a, a, a famous uh, professor, Doc Edgerton, um, who was the inventor of the stroboscopic flash. Um, and this work, uh, he applied actually during World War II to uh, the stroboscopic techniques for surveying bombing sites. Um, but he also did some um, very beautiful photography um, that illuminated some physics that were really um, sort of unknown. And these are just some, some very popular examples. So this is using a flash photograph um, on a sort of microsecond time scale, so a millionth of a second to observe what happens when you drop uh, a single drop in a very still dish of milk. Um, and what forms is this crown, um, and you see evidence of what in physics is called symmetry breaking, where the, you see a formation of this crown, um, and, it's, and it's very repeatable. Um, and in fact, this is not the drop falling, this is a drop of milk that comes back up through the center um, after, this, after this splash and the, and the crown is formed. So this is revealed for the first time using these sort of stroboscopic techniques. Um, and there's a number of other examples. These are all um, involving bullets, uh, in this case, passing through the king of diamonds. And you can see the very symmetric pattern that's left behind um, due to the motion of the bullet through the card. This is a, a bullet passing through an apple. And you see what may be sort of unexpected. Of course, you see stuff being blown out the, the front side, but you also see um, material being ejected from the back um, as, you, as, as the bullet passes through, and you can see the bullet being captured um, in flight. Um, one more example is uh, a bullet passing through a series of balloons. And so you can see here the balloon um, is already shredded. And the bullet has passed by um, some time ago. Here the balloon is starting to fall apart. Um, can anybody see where the bullet actually is in this picture? So this is the bullet here. In fact, it's already passed through this balloon, um, but you've captured this before any distortion really has happened to the balloon at all, although you can see a, a small amount here. Um, so this is sort of the state of the art up until, uh, um, up until the invention of the laser. So let me um, talk a little bit about the sort of timescales um, that, that I'm going to discuss in this talk. Um, I'm going to talk about femtosecond timescales. Um, and on this sort of uh, logarithmic scale, if you think of one minute as sort of the midpoint, one minute is sort of the geometric mean um, between 10 femtoseconds and the age of the universe. So another way to put it is one minute is to the age of the universe as 10 femtoseconds is to one minute. Um, so that gives you sort of maybe a rough sense of, 
of, of what a femtosecond is. Maybe I'll try to put this in another context that uh, um, may have some more immediacy to people's uh, lives today. <laughs> Um, so if you think in monetary terms and you compare one femtosecond to one second, it's like comparing one penny um, to the national debt, um, something on the order of $11 trillion. And just to sort of uh, drive this point home, this is a jar of pennies, sort of a you know, water jug of pennies that's on the order of $100 worth of pennies. Probably many of you have seen a $100 bill. So. A stack of these, a million pennies, $10,000. So a million femtoseconds, that brings us up to sort of one nanosecond time scale. Still incredibly fast. That's the time scale of the, of the clock cycle in your, in your computer. Um, so a nanosecond, uh, a million pennies, we're still nowhere near one second. A million dollars, something you could fit in a small briefcase if they're stacked in $100 bills, or $100 million, the size of uh, you know, two of these uh, lecterns. Um, but still nowhere near ten trillion dollars. A billion dollars, something you might fit in a flatbed truck. Um, so fifty or so of these is a, is a net worth of Bill Gates or whoever is the current richest man in the world. One trillion and ten trillion dollars. And this is the human down here. So you get an idea of how many femtoseconds there really are in one second, um, and how incredibly short period of time that, re that really is. Um, so you might ask yourself, well, why do we really care then? If it's really so short in time, why is it relevant? I mean, it's not the sort of time scale that any of us really perceive um, in any meaningful kind of way. Um, but it is important, uh, and I'll hopefully illustrate that in the, in the course of the talk. So this gives you just uh, some benchmarks um, if you think of, you know, sort of second time scales um, characterized by what you can measure with a stopwatch or millisecond time scales with a shutter, um, chemical explosions maybe happen on a millionth of a second time scale. I mentioned already clock cycles of computers, um, but now sort of below this kind of nanosecond time scale, a billionth of a second time scale, we enter sort of the ultra fast domain more or less. And here things start to get um, very interesting, things also start to get very small uh, in addition to getting very fast. So now we're on the time scale of molecular vibrations and the time scale of electronic motion um, in solids um, and the time scale for electrons to interact in correlated materials like high temperature superconductors. Um, so these are the kind of time scales um, going down from picoseconds, um, a millionth of a millionth of a second um, to, to femtoseconds and uh, with current techniques people are now pushing into the attosecond regime. Um, and just to give you a, an idea, if you think of uh, visible light, um, which has a wave-like nature, um, you think about one period of visible light, um, that corresponds to about two femtoseconds is one period. So if you can capture one period of visible light, that's already two femtoseconds. Um, and of course, ultra-fast technology um, spans not just the visible range, um, but into the terahertz range, and I'll talk about uh, into the x-ray range. So this just gives you a little bit of perspective um, of the electromagnetic spectrum. We only perceive sort of the visible part of the spectrum here. Um, of course, all the way out into the infrared range, wavelengths may be on the order of um, microns to millimeters. Um, and this is sort of the terahertz part of the spectrum. Um, and the other extreme in x-rays usually think about photon energies. So whereas in the visible, photon energies are around one electron volt here, they're on the order of 1,000 electron volts. Um, and of course, these become relevant for looking at things like um, atoms um, and things on the, uh, on the sort of uh, molecular uh, scale. So historically, um, ultra-fast techniques have, have been um, initially developed in the visible regime, but now they've spread out and there are ultra-fast techniques in the terahertz range um, and even in the x-ray range, as, as I'll discuss. Um, this just sort of gives you another perspective um, of people's ability to develop um, ultra-fast pulses um, at different wavelengths. And there's really sort of a fundamental limit, which is one optical cycle. Um, we sort of mentioned this before. So if you think of that as the limit, this shows you that one cycle limit um, for different frequency ranges. Um, for very low frequencies in the, in the terahertz or microwave range, people have been able to generate sort of single cycle pulses. Um, and now into the visible regime, people can generate one or a few um, cycle pulses. Um, and even into the attosecond regime, uh, people are generating now very close to single or few cycle pulses. 
Um, and this now is in the high frequency range or in the high energy range sort of microwave uh, and sort of uh, um, soft x-ray um, energy range. So how are people generating these pulses? Um, I'm really not going to say a lot about lasers um, themselves other than, th other than this slide, which just shows just a few of the um, um, key advances in the field. Um, one was the development of the colliding pulse mode lock ring dye laser. This was sort of the state of the art uh, up until uh, 20 or so years ago. Um, and this kind of laser could produce um, a few tens of femtosecond pulses. Um, but it's relatively large and it's based on flowing uh, um, streams of organic dyes. Um, more modern technology um, is based on titanium sapphire. Um, so sapphire that's doped with titanium, it's actually sort of pink in color. And now you can get um, lasers that will generate sort of few cycle pulses that are sort of the size of a shoebox or so. Um, and so these show the developments, in particular the development of passive mode locking uh, and, the, and the reduction in pulse duration um, until the current record today is something on the order of about three femtoseconds um, for a pulse coming directly out of um, a laser, uh, a laser oscillator like this. Of course, for many of the experiments I'm going to describe, these uh, lasers, these oscillators, are just a starting point. From here, the pulses are amplified and manipulated, and all sorts of tricks are played um, to push to other wavelengths, um, to push to shorter pulse durations. Um, but this is what you can get um, out, of the, out of the laser itself without um, that, sort of, that sort of additional um, gymnastics. And this kind of shows you a, an example of what one of these pulses looks like. So you can see these are the optical cycles here. And here is the envelope of the pulse. Um, this one's a little bit messy. Um, it's not as clean as, uh, as people would like for, for most experiments. So let me talk a little bit about how these kind of pulses are used um, to do uh, ultra-fast measurements. Um, we use a stroboscopic technique um, that I think most people are, are, are familiar with in, in some sense. Um, in this case, the sources of the light that we're using, the strobe light, if you will, um, are one of these femtosecond laser systems. Um, again, one of these oscillators, often with cascaded amplifiers and various nonlinear optical techniques um, on top of that. Uh, but this generates our femtosecond pulses, hopefully at the right wavelength and pulse duration that we want. Um, and we use optical techniques to take this pulse and split it and send one pulse through one arm uh, of the apparatus, and the second pulse passes through the beam splitter through another arm of the apparatus. So now you've created two pulses, and you can control the relative delay of these two pulses simply by moving these mirrors. So ultimately everything is done with mirrors, and hopefully not smoke, but at least mirrors. Um, and so you can vary this delay, and you can vary uh, the position of this probe pulse relative to the excitation pulse. So the dynamics start with this pump pulse, and you measure the response of whatever it is you're studying as you scan this probe pulse at various times. And in this case, we're just looking at their transmission through the sample uh, in a spectrometer, and we're recording snapshots um, at various time delays. And of course, these time delays can be extremely short. Um, you can easily have a mechanical stage that'll move a micron or a fraction of a micron. Um, and just for reference, one micron is, is already three femtoseconds. So you can easily have a stage that will move, uh, you know, so with, with sort of sub femtosecond precision, um, just using uh, mechanical techniques. So that's the way that most of these experiments are done. This is sort of a simplified version. Um, there are much more elaborate schemes that people use for these kind of pump probe measurements. So let me give you an example of um, why uh, stuff on the ultrafast time scale is relevant. Um, and I'm going to use a, one of my favorite examples that I think um, all of you can relate to. Um, it's a process that's going on right now as you're watching this talk. Um, and without um, these processes going on on the ultrafast time scale, ultimately you really wouldn't be able to see. Um, and the, the um, physics that I'm talk of, gonna, going to talk about um, is the, the first step in vision. Um, so I'm going to start with a schematic of the, of the eye, um, which is a, the visual system. Um, and you can see it's comprised of a, a lens um, and a cornea that collects light coming from this direction on the left and images that um, onto the retina. Um, and of course the retina is the optical sensor um, that ultimately sends the signal to the brain. So this is where all the activity is. This is where the energy of the photon is converted into some useful information. Um, so what's going on in the retina of the eye? Well, probably all, re, uh, all of you already know that um, the retina is made up of rod cells and cone cells. Um, these are specialized, specialized nerve cells, um, and they carry the fundamental photoreceptor um, within these um, rod and cone cells. 
Um, so if you look at these specialized nerve cells, um, at one end is a, a synapse that connects to other nerve cells and eventually sends a signal to your brain. At, at the other end is a um, sort of a folded membrane um, or, or discs, a series of discs. Um, and this is where the photoreceptor lies. And so if you look in a little bit more closely, inside the membranes, the sort of folded membrane, um, is a retinal chromophore. It's a very um, special uh, molecule called rhodopsin. Um, and it's not just the molecule itself that's important, but the fact that it sits inside a little cage of proteins. Um, and that's where um, all of the action is. That's where um, the um, energy of the photon is really converted into um, chemical energy that ultimately sends a signal to your brain. So this is what this molecule looks like. Um, these are all just carbon molecules, alternating single and double bonds, so it's just a, um, a, a chain of, uh, um, a polyene chain of, of carbon. Um, and you can see that there's a particular kink here around the number 11 and number 12 um, carbon atoms. Um, and then this connects uh, ultimately to the, to the surrounding protein. So this is referred to as the cis um, form of, uh, of rhodopsin. It's the, the twisted form of rhodopsin. What happens in this system is that when a photon comes in through your eye, it excites this molecule, and it, the molecule untwists um, into this configuration, which is referred to as a, as a trans configuration. It's basically twisting around this 11-12 double bond, which is normally locked, the photon more or less unlocks this bond and allows the molecule to untwist. So how can we study that um, to understand really what's going on um, between these two very different looking molecules? Well, we can look at the absorption of these molecules. Um, and that's what I'm showing here, is what this absorption looks like as a function of wavelength. Um, so in this untwisted form, in this trans form, you see the uh, absorption is peaked around 550 nanometers. Um, a little bit to the red side of the spectrum. Um, and in this twisted form, it's absorbing around 500 nanometers in the green side of the spectrum. So immediately you could say, well, all right, if we can measure this absorption um, as it evolves in time, um, we could actually get information about how this molecule behaves um, dynamically um, to understand the dynamics of this process. Um, and so that's exactly what, uh, what we set out to do. Um, so this is just a schematic of, of how you understand this untwisting process. Um, these are potential energy surfaces. You can think of these as, uh, as hills and valleys, basically. Um, and what's happening is, along this direction, the molecule is untwisting. So we refer to this as the isomerization coordinate or the twisting coordinate. So here it's at zero degrees, it's twisted. Here it's at 90 degrees, here it's at 180 degrees, completely untwisted. When the uh, system is excited, you basically promote it from this surface to this surface. And um, if the molecule behaved as, as a ball would, just rolling on a hill, you would expect that the ball is going to, that you start up here, is just going to roll back and forth, eventually damp down to the bottom. Um, and then the chemical reaction would cause the system to split with some molecules going back to this side and other molecules going back to that side. So that was sort of the conventional picture. Um, and we set out to study this um, using 10 femtosecond pulses at two different wavelengths. Um, in the green part of the spectrum and in the red part of the spectrum. So we could cover um, both of these uh, absorption peaks and watch how they um, evolve in time. So I want to go into a lot of the details, but uh, first let me just show you what one of these um, experiments looks like. So this is a, um, a flowing jet. It's a liquid jet with these rhodopsin molecules dissolved um, in a um, water and soap solution. Um, and passing through these, are these um, green and red femtosecond pulses. Um, of course, they look continuous here by eye, um, but in fact, they're, um, each pulse is um, whatever, about 10 microns or so uh, in duration, so much thinner than the, than the width of a human hair, just flying through here at the speed of light. And of course, we're going to use this to measure the absorption of, this, of these molecules as you delay one pulse with respect to the other. So that's what uh, this shows here. Um, are these snapshots of the absorption of these molecules. Um, and this is actually the, the change in absorption. So the change um, in absorption, um, it's a differential measurement. You take uh, absorption measurement with a pulse on and absorption with a pulse off, and you subtract the two. Um, the key thing is that if you look in this region, um, which is where we expect the um, untwisted molecule to start absorbing, indeed, you start to see this absorption appear and it's appearing very quickly. So these are snapshots 
um, made on the femtosecond time scale. Um, and already by 100 femtoseconds, something is starting to appear. It's growing in more by 150 femtoseconds. By 200 femtoseconds, this absorption is more or less completely developed, and then it doesn't really change very much after that. So that's really the first hint that this whole process, this change from this twisted molecule to this untwisted molecule, um, is finished really on a, on a sort of 200 femtosecond time scale. And in fact, you can do measurements taking time slices through this sort of, um, um, through these sort of spectra at specific wavelengths. And you can map out how things are evolving in time. And so at this critical wavelength where we expect this to start absorbing, we see this feature growing in and we see that it grows in in 200 femtoseconds. Um, so that was the first hint that this first step in vision is really done on this kind of time scale. Um, and it has actually important implications because it's the speed of this process that makes the visual system as efficient as it is. If this did not happen on this kind of time scale, um, the visual system would not, not be uh, nearly as sensitive as it is. Um, the other thing that you can learn from this kind of, um, these kinds of measurements looks like sort of noise on the data, but in fact, these are oscillations. And these bumps are meaningful uh, and they're reproducible. Um, and a more careful interpretation tells us that not only is this molecule untwisting on a 200 femtosecond time scale, but it's untwisting so quickly um, that in this configuration, it's actually quivering. So the molecule is quivering, um, and you see that as oscillations uh, in the data that persist um, until, these, uh, until these quivering mo this quivering motion uh, damps out. Um, so this is kind of uh, the sort of measurements that people can do using optical techniques. Um, at some level, it's not so satisfying because it tells us the time scale. Um, it tells us that the molecule is vibrating. It really doesn't tell us anything about where the atoms are. It doesn't tell us anything about where the electrons are that are, that are bonding these atoms together. Um, and so that's a real challenge in the field is to advance beyond these sort of spectral measurements um, to measurements that can really tell us in real time where the atoms are and where the electrons are. And so that's really where, um, where much of the field is going now. Um, this is just another coming back to the little diagram that I showed you before of this picture that I described um, where you imagine the light sort of exciting the molecule and it behaving like a ball um, on a, in a bowl or in a dish. Uh, this process is so fast that it's telling us that that's really not what's happening at all. In fact, what's happening is that the molecule is sort of tunneling straight through from this configuration to this configuration. And so this sort of classical picture um, doesn't apply at all. And so that's sort of the, um, the new kind of physics that emerge um, from these kinds of um, studies. Of course, where do people want to go with these kinds of techniques? Ultimately, they want to use um, light fields and shaped light fields um, to really control uh, um, matter, to sort of not only study where the atoms and electrons are, but to put atoms and electrons and push atoms and electrons to where, they, where we want them to be, um, to control um, chemical reactions, for example, to control material properties. Um, so that's really the challenge. Uh, and with the current techniques, um, we actually can not only create short optical pulses, but you actually have almost complete control um, of the amplitude and phase of these light pulses. Um, much as you, as you have uh, with um, um, modern uh, recording technology that allow you to, um, to mix and to, and to control um, sound, um, you can apply these techniques to light fields. Um, and people are starting to apply these techniques more or less to relatively simple molecules um, to control um, reaction pathways. Um, the challenge is really to apply these techniques to condensed matter where you have, where the molecules are, are uh, where the atoms are tightly packed together, where the bonding is much more complicated, where the density is very high, um, being able to apply these kind of coherent control techniques to this sort of condensed matter is, is a major challenge. Um, and it's not so much for just controlling materials, but by doing this, you can actually get new insight into the uh, underlying properties of these materials. Um, so I'll give you an example of, um, of these kinds of measurements and, and what can be learned from them. Um, so I'm going to switch now from molecules to uh, condensed matter. Um, and I'm going to talk about two materials. Um, so one that's probably very familiar to all of you, at least at some level, um, is silicon. Um, so this is a hunk of silicon. Um, and this shows you how the atoms are arranged in a very regular pattern. Um, and because of what we know uh, about silicon, um, there's a, a very well-developed theories 
that can accurately predict what the properties of these materials are, the mechanical properties, but more importantly, the, the electrical properties. Um, and so the electronic behavior of silicon is extremely well known. And of course, this is the foundation for all of modern electronics, not only the transistor, but um, uh, power switching and other techniques are based on our understanding of, uh, of, this, of this material. Um, let me contrast that with what we refer to as, a, 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 as an example of a complex material. Um, and this is a manganite uh, material. So it doesn't look too much different from silicon, at least when you look at a, at a hunk of it. Um, but if you look at the atomic structure, it's very different. Whereas here you have all silicon atoms neatly arranged, more or less as you might imagine oranges being stacked at the supermarket. Um, here the structure is very different. There's manganese atoms, there are oxygen atoms, um, and there's rare earth or, or, or alkaline earth atoms uh, involved in this uh, material. And they're arranged in a very peculiar way. So here are the manganese atoms in the middle, and they're surrounded by this sort of cage of oxygen. So you have this, this sort of uh, diamond-shaped cage of oxygen atoms uh, around the manganese atoms, and they're not really stacked in a very regular way. You can see they're all tilted at, at, at very specific angles. So this is a perovskite structure, and, and the fact that these are tilted means it's, it's actually a distorted perovskite structure. Because of this, there are, um, these materials exhibit um, many sort of exotic properties. So if you take this material and apply a magnetic field, um, it will change from being an insulator to being a, a conductor. Um, and some of these exotic properties are related to um, other compounds like high temperature superconductors. So being able to understand these kinds of materials is a, is a major challenge. They're very poorly understood right now. And there's really no good predictive theory to tell us um, how these materials are going to behave um, in contrast to electronics. And the theory for semiconductors was really worked out um, sort of at the turn of the last century. Um, and so that's been the foundation for much of, uh, uh, of modern electronics. And we're just in the very early stages of, of trying to understand these sort of complex materials. So let me just describe one experiment that we've done um, in the area of ultrafast control, um, switching um, a material from being an insulator to being, from being a poor conductor of electrons um, to being a, a metal um, on a time scale of 100 femtoseconds. Um, so this is a, an experiment that was done by uh, Matea, Matea Rini here at the Berkeley Lab. Um, so we took uh, one of these manganite compounds and what we wanted to do was come in and manipulate a very specific um, structure aspect of this molecule. We wanted to push the manganese and oxygen atoms um, uh, apart and together. Um, we wanted to excite this manganese oxygen stretching mode. Um, and we could do this by exciting with an ultrafast pulse um, in, in, in the mid infrared part of the spectrum. So we come in with this pulse and we excite this manganese oxygen stretch, and, which is a very subtle distortion of the material. And you can come in and measure the reflectivity and you can see that with this sort of vibrational excitation, you see dramatic changes in the reflectivity. Um, it still doesn't tell you that you've got a metal, um, but you can actually do an electrical measurement and you can see that you can switch from being an insulator um, to a metal and that this is happening in sort of a 100 femtosecond time scale. And this is kind of a, um, uh, an artist view of what's really happening this shows this distortion between the manganese and the oxygen atoms and how it's evolving because of this excitation. And this is um, sort of an artist's conceptual drawing of how the electrons are changing um, uh, in concert with this structural change. Um, so this is an example of, of controlling a material property on the ultrafast time scale. Um, but again, from these kinds of measurements, we really don't know exactly where the electrons are and we don't really know where the atoms are. Um, so that remains a, a major challenge in the field um, is, to, um, is to get that sort of detailed information. Um, and that brings me to the uh, second part of my talk. Um, how do we get that sort of information? Um, one important way to do this, um, to get this sort of information, are to use x-rays. Um, so whereas the optical measurements give you sort of very indirect information about atomic positions, you measure this absorption spectrum, but you don't know where the atoms and electrons are. Um, X-rays have the potential to really give you much more direct information. Um, X-rays interact with the atomic core, so it sort of tells you um, um, where the atoms are or can tell you where the atoms are. Um, and because of the short wavelength of X-rays on the order of an angstrom, the wavelength is on the order of the bond distance. And so you can use X-rays to get actually accurate measurements um, of bond distances. So the dream really is to be able to use x-ray techniques in a stroboscopic way 
um, to actually make movies um, of atomic motion and ultimately of electron motion. Um, and so this is just a cartoon uh, of that process where you might initiate dynamics with a light pulse and use an X-ray strobe um, to follow the motion of the atoms. Now in this case, the X-ray comes in and it diffracts. It creates a scattering pattern. Um, but these sort of diffraction patterns or scattering patterns um, can be directly inverted um, um, using computer algorithms to determine the atomic positions. Um, and so that's sort of the dream and, and the whole field of sort of ultrafast X-ray science is really um, uh, just sort of in its infancy right now. But I want to sort of give you um, some examples of what's being done in this area. Um, this sort of uh, describes um, more detailed aspects of X-rays um, where you can use X-ray spectroscopy techniques um, to look at bond distances. Um, and I'm going to show you some examples of this, so I won't go through the details of this particular slide. Um, so of course, any discussion of X-rays, certainly at the Berkeley Lab, has to start with the advanced light source. Um, and for those of you that um, have not uh, been to the advanced light source, I encourage you to take a tour. Um, what is this? Um, it's really um, arguably the brightest source um, of soft X-rays anywhere in the world. Um, and how are these um, soft X-rays generated? Well, they're generated in a high energy storage ring. Um, so this is sort of a cartoon of this high energy storage ring. So these are the electrons and they're stored in this storage ring um, at sort of uh, 2 billion electron volt energies. They're stored at, um, and, and propagate around the storage ring um, at very near the speed of light. Um, and they're stored in bunches. So the electrons are in, in short packets, relatively short. They're about 70 picoseconds, whereas most of the measurements that I've been talking about have been at 70 or below 100 femtoseconds. So three orders of magnitude difference, but still relatively short. Um, so the electrons are propagating around the storage ring. And whenever they come to um, a bending magnet, which is what forces the electrons into the circular trajectory, um, they emit X-rays. So that you get a, a fan or a spray um, of X-rays every time the electrons pass through one of these bending magnets. Um, but the real advantage of, of machines like the advanced light source is that they're specially designed for insertion devices. So these are devices um, that are periodic magnetic structures, um, very high strength magnets, um, arranged in, in periodic arrays, more or less like this. And of course, when the X-ray is passed through this, it's um, like a bend magnet, but, um, but raised uh, to some large factor based on the number of periods. And so the electrons now undergo more or less a sinusoidal trajectory, and again emit an X-ray, um, a spray of X-rays, but in this case, they're tightly collimated X-rays. Um, they're almost laser-like. They have reasonably good coherent properties. They're not fully coherent, um, but, they're, um, th but they're highly collimated uh, and very powerful for, um, for a variety of studies. So this just kind of gives you, for those of that have not seen the advanced light source, um, this gives you a, um, just a flavor of the range of science um, that can be done on a machine like this. Um, of course, with x-rays, um, one very, very powerful technique is microscopy. These, are, these form the basis for x-ray microscopes. Um, that allow you to look at um, cells, things on the, on the scale of a cell. Um, they allow you to look at the structure of proteins. Um, they allow you to take three-dimensional tomographic imaging of cells and the uh, in interior structure. Um, this is work that's done by Carolyn Maribel. Um, you can also use these um, for um, high-precision uh, soft x-ray optics. So these are um, uh, uh, techniques that are used for improving uh, the resolution of microscopes. Um, they can be used for very sensitive um, chemical probing at the microscopic scale. Um, they can be used for looking at electronic structure um, uh, for things like high temperature superconductors and other complex materials. They can allow you to generate maps of where the electrons are um, in materials like this. So just to uh, briefly come back to the example that I started with, this rhodopsin molecule that's in your eye, well, people have actually used the advanced light source to look at the structure of the very closely related molecule. Um, and in fact, here's a, the stick figure of this molecule. But the mesh are measurements of the structure of this molecule made at the advanced light source um, with sort of two angstrom resolution. Um, and it starts to show you where the electrons are. Not only the electron distribution along the molecule itself, but smaller um, molecular species that, that reside um, in, the, in the voids between the active molecule and this, and this protein environment. Um, so of course the challenge is to be able to get this sort of information 
this sort of structural information um, on the femtosecond time scale. And I mentioned that uh, the time scale that the ALS provides is um, sort of three orders of magnitude, a factor of a thousand, kind of longer than what we would like um, for these sort of ultra-fast measurements. Um, and, but we've been um, pursuing a technique, an approach that allows us to actually do these sorts of ultra-fast measurements at the advanced light source. Um, and this is a technique that was developed by uh, colleagues here in the Accelerator and Fusion Research Division, um, Sasha Zelens and Max Zolotorev. Um, and the idea is to take these long electrons inside the storage ring and use a femtosecond laser pulse to manipulate these electrons. So we take a femtosecond laser pulse, propagate it into the storage ring along with the electron beam, and we use this femtosecond laser pulse to manipulate the energy of the electrons um, and to basically carve out a femtosecond slice of the electrons. And then this femtosecond slice of electrons is used to generate directly femtosecond x-rays. So that's the, that's the approach that, uh, that we're pursuing. Um, this describes in a little bit um, more detail how this happens. So this interaction between the laser field and the electrons happens um, in one of these insertion devices, one of these periodic magnetic structures. And of course, as you send an electron through this periodic magnetic device, the electrons follow um, a sinusoidal trajectory um, and emit radiation. Um, now what happens when you introduce a laser into this picture? Well, the laser um, can accelerate the electrons. And so you apply the laser field, and it propagates with the electrons. And as the laser field is propagating, it increases the, the displacement of the electrons that you can see here and here. It's basically increasing um, the electron energy. It's accelerating the electrons. And we can use that to generate um, a femtosecond slice uh, of electrons. This sort of shows you the gory details that I'm not going to go through, but this is the, um, uh, gives you an idea of, the, of, of what's happening. This is the distribution of the electron beam. Um, it's a pencil-like beam. It's uh, a few centimeters long and, and uh, about the diameter of a, of a human hair or so. So this is really not drawn to scale, of course. Um, so this is the distribution of the electron beam um, in time um, and transversely, delta x or, or in energy. They're all monochromatic, single energy. As you propagate um, the laser field with this electron beam through one of these insertion devices, you modulate the energy following the laser field, um, which is now tens of optical cycles long, sort of 100 femtoseconds long. And you can push these electrons out um, in energy. And as they propagate around the storage ring, they, they spatially displace. And so you actually generate um, a femtosecond slice uh, of electrons that you can then use to generate femtosecond x-rays. So that's the, the origin of this femtosecond electron spike um, that, that we then use at, the, at these beam lines. This is sort of the layout of the ALS. Um, you can imagine the laser system is sitting at one end, and we're propagating laser pulses um, about 60 meters across the storage ring. Um, of the ALS, they interact with the electron beam, generate x-rays that then come back where we can do these sort of stroboscopic measurements. Uh, and we have actually two beam lines at the ALS, one that works in the soft x-ray range um, with photon energies of around 200 electron volts up to about 2,000 electron volts, and another beam line that goes up to about 10,000 electron volts. So a wide range of science um, uh, is available at these sort of beam lines. Um, the, Last couple of minutes, let me just talk about some experiments that we've been doing um, with these um, short pulses. Uh, and one is an experiment that we've been collaborating with um, Aaron Linderberg on, um, and this is to look at the structure of water. Um, and this is something that's um, important for, um, uh, arguably one of the most important materials uh, uh, anywhere, um, and forms a foundation for life. Um, and yet, for something that's so ubiquitous and so important, you'd think we would have a pretty good understanding of how it behaves. Um, and yet we really don't, particularly in the liquid state. Um, so this is sort of shows the structure of water um, in, uh, in, uh, when it's frozen in ice. Um, and it, uh, um, the atoms are arranged in a very regular pattern, in a tetrahedral um, pattern, with each oxygen um, sharing um, more or less equal bonding with four nearest neighbor hydrogen atoms. So you can see here's one H2O molecule and another H2O molecule, but they're all uh, neatly arranged. 
In the other extreme, when water is in the gas state or in the vapor state, each of these H2O molecules are largely isolated. They don't really talk to each other. There's no interaction between them, no bonding. Um, but of course, the interesting science is in the middle, um, in the water uh, phase. Um, and here, the hydrogen, the uh, water molecules form hydrogen bonds with neighboring water molecules. And these hydrogen bonds are constantly popping in and out of existence. Um, and it's this hydrogen bonding structure um, that give water um, its most important properties. Um, and yet it's really not very well understood. So what's the experiment that we've been trying to do? Well, if you look at the X-ray absorption spectrum um, of ice, shown here, and water vapor, shown here, you see that there's dramatic differences. Um, and so this sharp, spiky structure is a direct result of these sort of isolated water molecules. And this big feature here is a direct result of this ordered, uh, ordered structure that exists in ice. And of course, the liquid absorption spectrum is somewhere in between. And so this is actually gives you a very strong handle on understanding um, the dynamics of water because you can see a spectral signature um, that differentiates between this sort of fourfold coordination um, and this sort of isolated uh, um, water molecules. Uh, so that's the experiment that we set out to do. Um, these are done in a very specialized cell that allows us to capture a very thin film of liquid water and put it into a, a, a vacuum chamber. And what we're doing in these experiments is that we're taking, again, a very short mid-infrared pulse and using that to excite um, these water molecules, these OH stretching modes. And then we're going to come in with x-rays and we're going to probe the absorption spectrum um, with a short pulse of x-rays and watch how that evolves in time. Um, and this just shows you some of the early measurements um, on a femtosecond time scale, where you can see these sort of changes in these critical regions um, that reflect sort of ice-like structure and vapor-like structure. And you can see the differential changes, the change in absorbance um, uh, in, in the X-ray absorption range for water. And you can watch how these changes evolve now um, on the femtosecond time scale. So these are really just uh, in the very early um, um, stages of these kinds of experiments in this kind of field. Um, What's the future um, for ultrafast X-rays? So I've shown that we can sort of that we're making um, uh, important steps forward um, with a machine that really was not designed to generate short pulse X-rays, but is very powerful for other sorts of science. Um, what are the important future directions? Well, um, I can't finish this talk without talking about um, X-ray free electron lasers because they're really an important future um, for this field um, for ultrafast X-ray science. And the idea is that you can actually now take these kind of techniques and use them to actually build a true X-ray laser. Um, that's based on a technique called self-amplified spontaneous emission. Um, but basically, you're taking, uh, again, a high-energy electron beam, passing it through a magnetic structure. Um, and if the beam energy is right uh, and the field of, of the, uh, is right, um, the electrons will start to self-organize into very short bunches. Um, and they'll radiate a coherent X-ray beam. Um, so I won't go into the details of that, but these are now um, being built uh, and are starting to operate. Um, and in fact, one uh, that uh, just uh, um, was demonstrated in the last couple months was at uh, the Linac Coherent Light Source um, at SLAC. And here what they've done is their source of electrons is this um, two kilometer long linear accelerator. At the end of this two kilometer long linear accelerator, they put one of these periodic magnetic structures. And it's not sort of the two or three meter scale periodic structure that we have at the advanced light source. This is a uh, hundred meters long periodic structure um, that's sending out um, coherent x-rays um, for this sort of science. Um, and these kind of devices are being built now um, around the world. Um, the red are ones that are operational. So LCLS operating in the hard x-ray range. Um, in Hamburg, they have a facility operating in the soft x-ray range. Um, you can see a number of these are actually funded for construction. There's going to be an even bigger um, X-ray laser built uh, in Hamburg, um, a soft X-ray laser being built um, in Italy, and then a number of projects that are being proposed, um, in particular a very important project that's being proposed here for the Berkeley Lab, which is sort of an advanced version um, of these X-ray lasers. Um, this would be a soft X-ray laser. Um, this would be constructed where they're now um, doing demolition on the Bevatron site. Um, and so this would actually hold an array of these soft X-ray lasers with the electron beam coming from an accelerator that would be buried in the hillside um, underneath the ALS. And there's some important key attributes of this kind of machine that really makes it substantially advanced beyond what current um, machines are, are capable of doing. 
One is that it will use a superconducting accelerator um, that will allow this machine to run at very high repetition rates, whereas most current machines are sort of single shot machines. This will run at very high repetition rates. Um, so that's important for the science. It also allows us to feed an entire array um, of lasers that can each be configured um, for specific science applications. Um, and of course, these will be tied together with conventional laser systems um, for sort of femtosecond timescale measurements. Just to show you a quick comparison between the ALS, which is a, really a premier soft x-ray facility currently, and what you might envision for um, one of these dedicated machines. Of course, they're designed for ultra-short pulses. So a thousand times to a million times shorter than what you can get from the advanced light source. Pulses on the order of a femtosecond or less than a femtosecond. Though it's a laser, so that means it's spatially and temporally coherent. The average flux is maybe 10 times higher than what you can get from the advanced light source. But the average brightness is a million times, is 100,000 times higher. Um, and the peak flux is 10 million times higher. Uh, the peak brightness is a billion times higher. Um, so very powerful for doing these kinds of time resolve studies. Um, so with that, I will uh, finish and, uh, and take any questions. So uh, we're, we're filming this, and so uh, if you have a question, uh, raise your hand and, and let one of us uh, bring you a, micro, a microphone so that uh, we can record what, you, what your question is. I'm having a hard time seeing whether there are any hands up here. Who's going to go first? <laughs> yeah. Don't be camera shy. Okay. <laughs> Any question is fair game. Yeah. Uh, okay. How do you separate the uh, femtosecond X-ray from the picosecond X-ray? That's a good question. Um, what we rely on is the um, very high-quality imaging optics. So the femtosecond x-rays are a little bit spatially displaced from the long picosecond x-rays. And because the beamline optics are, um, are sort of high precision, they very faithfully image that. Um, and we can, uh, by imaging that onto a pair of slits, for example, we just put the slits where the femtosecond x-rays are. Um, and that provides us um, substantial discrimination from the, from the long pulse x-rays that come along with it. Bob, well, I have a really dumb question that I've been wanting to ask for years. What is the difference between a wiggler and an undulator? Um, the difference really is just in the strength of the magnetic field, um, which you would think is not so significant, but it actually ends up being important. Um, in the case of um, an undulator, the field strength is relatively modest. Uh, and as a result, you get um, a coherent superposition of light from one period to the next. Um, and so the light that comes out of an undulator um, is highly coherent, um, almost, almost laser-like. And that's because of this coherent um, addition from one cycle to the next and relatively modest um, perturbation of the electron trajectory. But as you make the magnetic field stronger and stronger, of course, the electrons wiggle more and more, and you destroy this coherent superposition. And so in the case of a wiggler, it looks just like an undulator, but the field is strong enough that it ends up looking just like a series of bend magnets that you've stacked together. Um, and so the emission that comes out um, is relatively incoherent. Um, but of course, there's a continuous boundary between one and the other. So any device will give you some sharp undulator peaks, but it will also give you um, sort of a wiggler or a bend magnet background. Um, and you can sort of balance one off against the other, depending on how strong the magnetic field is. So um, what effect does a, a longer undulator have on the, on the resulting beam? Is that uh, just in the power of the beam, or is it? Uh, in the power of the beam, so of course, yeah. because you're adding coherently, it goes as a number, d ignoring sort of other secondary effects, it goes as a number of periods squared. And so um, it's, it, having a longer undulator is a huge improvement. Um, but there, at some point, there's other practical limitations that, that um, so you can't get that benefit um, to some arbitrary extent. Um, but to first order, they have a number of periods that are, are a huge advantage for an undulator. I see. Okay, I'll stop hogging it. Um, you were saying that you were saying that um, the when it goes from the cis to trans conformation, that molecule, um, it sounded like you said it like skips the transition state or something. Uh, 
it, it, you said it tunneled through, and is that, uh, can you explain that further? I didn't. Um, yeah. This goes back to sort of a very conventional picture for these kind of chemical reactions. And the very conventional picture is based on these, what are referred to as adiabatic potential energy surfaces. Um, so systems that would behave, you know, more or less as a ball evolving the, on this sort of potential energy surface. Um, what this result is telling us is that these pictures really are, are no longer adequate. And really, what I would say we're at a point where we don't have the language to really kind of describe in, a, in any sort of um, thorough way um, what's happening. But basically, the, the, normal, the normal thing you would do in treating this is you treat the electrons and the, and the nuclei separately. And you assume that you can treat them separately because one evolves much faster than the other. Here, what's happening is they're, they're evolving more or less simultaneously. And what we really, a more accurate description is that there's sort of a tunneling or even a conical intersection that's described by these sort of dotted lines. Um, and what this means is that the probability of going from this surface to this surface doesn't just depend on the shape of the surface, but it depends on actually how fast the molecule is moving. Um, and so that's what comes into this sort of um, simple description for this sort of tunneling. Um, if your molecule has a bigger initial kick, it's much more likely to continue straight through and follow um, through this conical intersection than if it were moving very slowly, in which case it might behave just like a ball on a, in a bowl. I just was wondering if there's a simple way to understand, like I know the LCLS has like a 10 hertz rep rate, and for this um, soft X-ray FEL, you guys, I, I saw 100 kilohertz. I was wondering how, wh what is the technological difference? How do you get to the that? major difference? Really, are um, superconducting um, accelerator modules. Um, that's a huge difference. So. Um, conventional accelerator modules, I don't know what they build them out of copper, I think. Um, the power is applied in a pulsed way um, by these huge klystrons, um, these huge relatively crude amplifiers. Um, and you can only deliver that power at, at a limited repetition rate. There's only so much that they can tolerate. Um, so they're limited to sort of 10 or 100 hertz. Uh, because this is superconducting, um, and this is not high temperature superconductor, these are niobium, this is low temperature superconductors that are cooled at, at liquid helium temperatures. You can run the RF power into them continuously. Uh, so you have an RF field in there at, I don't know, sort of gigahertz frequencies. And so you can put electrons in um, as, fast as, as fast as you can generate them. And that ends up, I think, being the limitation. Um, but that's a, um, a huge distinction that allows you to go to high repetition rates with these advanced superconducting modules. Um, so these are the kind of things that they're using at, in CERN at the accelerator. And so many of you may have heard that they had a, um, a leak of liquid helium, and it actually took them months to allow this supercooled um, accelerator that's, I don't know how many, 100 kilometers in diameter or whatever it is, it took it months to warm back up to room temperature before they could come back in and work on it. Um, and that's because they're using these kinds of modules that are cooled with, with liquid helium. Anybody else? Um, and you'll have the short pulses available so that in principle you could watch this in time. So you can actually see how these correlations change uh, in time. Um, and this is, right now it's sort of a dream, but there are proposals um, that allow you to do, apply the kind of time-resolved Raman that people now routinely do in the femtosecond domain in the X-ray domain um, and use this to look at, um, at correlations between electrons. And so that's really the, the goal, of one, an important goal of this. But I would say at this point it's, um, it's sort of in the distant future. But at least this sort of opens the door. It puts you in that sort of time scale, sort of sub-femtosecond time scale where you might look at those sorts of effects. We've uh, actually wrapped up uh, an hour. Let me uh, take one more question, and then after that, uh, I'm sure uh, the Bob will be around for a few minutes if you want to come up and say hi. Thanks a lot for taking my question. Um, basically, these pulses are so fast that you said a computer's uh, clock rate is like nanoseconds, right? How are you me like measuring, actually recording these pulses the pulse to compare? That's with a, one another? That's a good question. Um, essentially what happens is the pulse measurement technique at some level becomes an experiment in itself. And we use the pulse to measure itself, um, essentially. Um, so if you, 
sorry, if I go back here. So here, of course, we're interested in studying the dynamics of the sample. Um, but if you replace a sample with a nonlinear crystal, it has more or less an instantaneous response. And so you can basically use this pulse to measure this pulse. And what you get out is what's called the convolution of the two pulses. But from that, and from more sophisticated techniques, um, you can actually extract um, not only the duration of the pulse, but the entire shape. And that's what's been done here. Um, it wasn't, this wasn't measured in this way, but this is um, reconstructed from, from one of these measurements that allow you to measure um, the envelope of the pulse and the phase. And so you can reconstruct exactly what the pulse looks like. But it's basically using one pulse to measure another. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for coming, and uh, we hope we'll see you at the next lecture.